Yes. Okay, we're ready to go. Uh, everyone, I want to welcome to Gigi in the 561 today a very, very special guest. Uh, very honored to have you here, Francis Gary Powers, Jr., uh, who many of you will recognize that name, and if you don't, you should, and you will. Uh, he was born in 1965 and holds a bachelor degree in philosophy, a master's degree in public administration, master's degree in U.S. history. He's the founder and chairman emeritus of the Cold War Museum located at Mint Hill, Virginia. He is the chairman of the Presidential Advisory Committee for the Cold War Theme Study, which assists the National Park Service to identify historic Cold War sites for preservation. In 2015, he consulted for a Steven Spielberg thriller that I'm sure we've all seen, Bridges, Bridge of Spies, excuse me, about the 1962 spy exchange between KGB spy Rudolph Abel and CIA U2 pilot Francis Gary Powers, Sr. Uh, Gary is also the author of Letters from a Soviet Prison and Spy Pilot. He lectures internationally appears regularly on news broadcast, and is married with one son. Gary, um, welcome. Well, thank you, Pam, for having me on. It is a true honor. And um, as I mentioned to you before, you have done so much, but I do want to speak about your dad just a little bit, the heroic father that, that you had and highly decorated uh, well, your dad, the, the decorations that he received uh, are vast. Um, intelligence star, silver star, distinguished flying cross, uh, National Defense Service medal, a, a, a lot. Uh, he, he, was, he was a real hero. And you have spent so many years making sure that correct information is out there about what happened back in the 60s when his plane was shot down. Uh, thank you for doing that because I'm a big history buff and history is lost. I think it's being lost and it's important. It's important that we know history. And so thank you for all the work that you've done for that. Well, thank you very much for the compliments. Uh, when I look back on what I've done, I don't think I've done much, but I guess I have. <laughs> you have. You definitely have. And and I have to tell you, though, in my my days and days of research on you and reading, I am completely, I have been completely riveted to to you and to your to your journey, your story. I, of course. I'm well aware of your of your dad and his capture in the Soviet Union, how he the plane went down, and all of all of the, the just the, the historic events that took place during that time. Um, but one thing that really stuck out to me in doing my research on you, there was a there was a photo of you, and you were actually in Russia. And you were placing, I, would, I hope that you will tell us about this, you were placing uh, flowers uh, at the actual MiG pilot that tried to shoot your dad down at his burial place. And it was very moving to me for so many reasons. Would you, could you, would you mind talking about that for just a second? Well, sure, Pam. Thank you for asking. Um, I had the opportunity to do a consulting job in Moscow back in December, I want to say either 2017 or 2018. And as a side trip, I booked a flight <clears throat> with the gentleman I was consulting for to Sverdlovsk, which is now known as Yekaterinburg. And that is the city where the U-2 was shot down uh, over. Um, when I got to that area, I had heard about and knew about the MiG pilot, Sergei Safronov, who was killed on May 1st by friendly fire uh, while trying to shoot down my father. And a few years prior to my visit, I had met with the pilot's son. He and I talked through an interpreter, and he conveyed to me the following message. He indicated that his mother did not blame my father for her husband's death, that he was following orders, my dad was following orders, 
it wasn't his fault that her husband died by friendly fire. So I took that to heart, and that really touched me. So when I was in Ekaterinburg, I wanted to pay my respects to the family and to the MiG pilot. So I asked my host about uh, what I could do and where could I get flowers, and I, that I wanted to do this. No one prompted me to do this. I wanted to do it of my own accord. So we found some flowers. Um, I'm in my coat and tie. I'm in the back of the van. We get up to the memorial, and I'm about to get out to play the, uh, place these flowers down. Well, my host turns to me and goes, Gary, don't smile. And I went, what do you mean, don't smile? There, there's you know, tons of press all around. I'm supposed to smile for the camera. He goes, no, no, no. If you smile when you're presenting these flowers, it will be an insult to the Russian people. Oh, oh. my gosh, thank you very much. I appreciate Ooh. that. Yeah. And then he tells me, don't turn your back on the memorial. And I went, what do you mean? How am I supposed to walk away? You go up. You present the flowers, you take some time to reflect, you stand up, you take three or four steps backwards, and then you turn around. Um. And that way you will be showing the utmost, utmost respect. So this is what I did, and it went over very well. Um, I have that picture on my website because it is very important to me. Yeah. I felt it was very important to reach out and pay my respects to the family, to the MiG pilot, and to the Russian people for that historic event that happened on May 1st of 1960. Well, it, it's very stirring. I mean, the photo you did, everything they told you, everything that you then did worked beautifully to convey the respect that you were showing. And when I read the cut line, I, I went, oh, that is something I really want to talk about because it's it was striking and uh, very... Uh, very thoughtful of you beyond I think what most people perhaps would have done. So uh, that 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 is the uh, I, I think that you having it there on your page is is um, excellent. Very very well done. Well, I did you. want to ask you about the uh, your role uh, on the with the Park Service. Are you still on that advisory board? The president's. Um, uh. Uh, it's the President's Council or Advisory Board for the uh, the Cold War, uh, where you uh, the preservation of Cold War sites. Are you still involved doing that? Yes, I am currently the chairman of the Presidential Advisory Board for the Cold War Theme Study, and this was initially um, enacted, for lack of a better word, uh, uh, initially uh, uh, developed uh, probably ten years ago, if not a little more. And it was comprised of, or it is comprised of, leading Cold War historians and academics who were tasked with finding and identifying Cold War historic sites around the country in the United States for preservation, interpretation, and commemoration. Um, so, as you know, government work goes slow. I didn't mm -hmm. realize it would take 10 years to do this theme study <laughs> wow. through, through different presidential administrations, wow. uh, through different um, uh, changes of personnel. Um, things move very slowly in Washington. But we are getting to the point this year in 2021 where we were finally, I believe, if all works out well, ready to submit the final product to the Park Service so that they can take it and uh, develop a Cold War uh, uh, themed trail around the United oh. States and to commemorate these historic sites associated with the Cold War. That is incredible. That is something I would do in a heartbeat. It's like kind of like a Cold War trail, similar to the Civil War trails that they have out currently. Now you are you are I believe Chairman Emeritus of the Cold War Museum. Is is that correct? Uh, yes, I am. I'm I'm the founder and Chairman Emeritus. Would you tell us about the Cold War Museum? Because I think maybe it's a girl thing, but you know the idea of spy Cold War. Uh, I think it's mysterious and captivating, and uh, so, but in reality, a, a lot of it is uh, it is almost uh, an academic process that <laughs> that perhaps is not it's not so romantic. But if but would you talk? Talk us through the, the museum just a little bit, if you don't mind. 
Oh, sure. Well, in order to talk to you through the museum, I need to talk to you why I founded the museum. <laughs> okay. That's, oh, even um, better, even better. Back when I first moved to the Washington, D.C. area in about 1992, I was in a graduate program at George Mason University, public administration, nonprofit management, doing my master's degree. I started to give lectures to local high schools in the area. Nine times out of ten, I would walk into a Cold War classroom, I mean a, a history classroom, to give a talk on the Cold War and specifically the U-2 incident. Mm-hmm. Nine times out of ten, I get blank stares. The kids would look at me with this blank expression. They thought I was there to talk about the U-2 rock band. <laughs> so <laughs> that was the first clue that something had to be done to preserve Cold War history. A few years go by, and I realize that um, the way to preserve this history is to create a museum. And so here I am in 1996. I found the Cold War Museum to honor Cold War veterans, preserve Cold War history, and educate kids, students, about this time period. What I thought would take three years to do, fundraise $3 million, shouldn't be too hard to do. Well, it took 15 years to get brick and mortar. Wow. And during that time period, between 96 and 2011, we were able to gather millions of dollars in Cold War artifacts, all donated to the Cold War Museum, through veterans, through organizations, uh, or through municipalities. We have the largest collection of civil defense items in America, having saved and salvaged the civil defense headquarters for Washington, D.C., We have items from the former Soviet Union, East Germany, West Germany, uh, America, uh, different countries in Africa, South America that were all involved in the Cold War. The Cold War was a world war. It affected every country to one extent or another, some countries more than others, like Germany that had the Berlin Wall dividing it. So during my research, specifically to find out about my father, that's why I was doing this research, I discovered that there were hundreds of thousands of other men and women who fought, sacrificed, some of which who died during this conflict of the Cold War that had not been recognized for their service to their country. So I thought it was very important to honor the Cold War veterans, preserve the history, and educate the students. So that's why we founded the museum. Wow. So now, is it open right now during this pandemic situation? Is it? Uh, can people visit there now? Uh, yes, it is open on the weekends. Uh, there is limited access. We have to make sure that we don't go over our um, what do you call it? Uh, our uh, minimum or maximum uh, 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 um, uh, people in the room at the one time uh, occupancy. So um, it is open on the weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, staffed by volunteers. It is located at Vint Hill Farms Station, 45 miles west of Washington, D.C., right next to Gainesville, Virginia. Uh, Vint Hill Farm Station is a former listening post. It was an Army base used by CIA, NSA, um, ASA, Army Security Agency, and other groups to electronically monitor the signals and the electronic communications from the Washington, D.C. embassies, as well as international signals from around the world. So basically it was an NSA listening post that would gather information, electronic uh, communications, etc., for interpretation and evaluation as to our enemies' strengths and weaknesses. So it's an authentic Cold War historic site. And it is open on the weekends, uh, staffed by volunteers, um, midweek by appointment, if you can't get there on a weekend, or for school groups. Ah, well... Even better for school groups. Awesome. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your books. You have two books that are are available on Amazon. Uh, Spy Pilot is one, and the other one is called Operation Overflight. Um, Well, well, hold on. Let me correct you. I'm sorry. Okay, Um, no, please do. uh, One book is Spy Pilot. The other book is Letters from a Soviet Prison. Oh, the, okay. The Operation Overflight is my dad's autobiography that oh, I had republished and wrote the epilogue for. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for that correction. Um, so were they, the, your books, were they, did it take a long time to get those out? What was your process there? Was it cathartic for you? I mean, 
I know you were fairly young when you lost your dad, um, uh, very tragically in a helicopter crash, and I'm very sorry. Um, but losing your dad, I believe you have said, kind of pushed you in a in a self guided exploration of discovery of yourself and your dad. Is that not right? Is, are those kind of the precursors to uh, like writing your books and the, the kind of the course that you've taken. Well, yes, it definitely influenced my life um, and the direction I took. Um, had my father not been a pilot, had he not been an internationally known spy, <laughs> I, I may have done something different. <laughs> um, but um, after his death in a helicopter accident on August 1st of 77, uh, I was 12 years old when that occurred. I didn't understand the significance of what he had gone through. I didn't understand why he was so controversial, why people thought he was a hero or a traitor. I didn't understand uh, why there were these different uh, uh, conspiracy theories and um, uh, different uh, 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 ideas as to what he did or did not do during the U-2 incident. And so as a way for me to find out the truth, so I could answer questions because people were curious and they'd ask me questions in high school. I didn't know how to answer them. Yeah. In college, I started to do this research, and it snowballed. And eventually I knew way even back then as a kid that I one day I would write a book. But it took 25 years of research. It took five years of writing the book before it was finally published in 2019. And over that time period, I gathered as much information as I could. I did interviews with my dad's colleagues, his pilot friends who flew with him in the Air Force of the U-2 program. I talked with uh, Soviet, uh, ex-Soviet military officials, uh, East Berlin, West Berlin military officials, people who were involved with uh, shooting him down, designing the missiles, or helping to exchange Rudolf Abel for him at the Glenacre Bridge in 1962. So I did all this research not to write the book, but to find out the truth. And once I found out the truth, then it was time to write the book. And so it all laid in, uh, it all, fortunately I didn't pass away before then, <laughs> or else it would never have been, been published. But um, it took 25 years of research to do this. And I did this in my spare time. Uh, for the most part, other than the last 10 years, I've always been employed by an organization that would help me to pay the bills and, and sustain my family. But the last 10 years, I've gotten to a level where I'm now self-employed, I lecture internationally, I have my two books out, and I uh, do um, uh, different events around the world to commemorate Cold War history. You are busy. And see, I thought all of this lengthy research that you did makes me feel terrible when I think, oh, I have done so much research. I really, <laughs> I haven't <laughs> on anything that I do compared to, to your level of research. Um, well, well, now, hold on. Don't cut yourself short. You've probably done as much research on different topics. Mine was well, focused on the Cold War and Dad. Uh, very importantly, and, and very glad that you have done all of that. I do want to talk Hollywood for just a moment. Uh, you were a technical consultant advisor for a, a very important film. Uh, it was Academy Award nominated. Um, and winner, actually, of at least one Oscar. Um, tell us about this brilliant Steven Spielberg film. I know that you um, gave them a ton of credit for for what they what they the the truth that they put out there about the film, but you also gave them license in you were not upset that they took a bit of creative license at, at some junctures of the film talk, talk to us about the film would you just a little bit oh sure well thank you that that, that was a great highlight of my life um steven spielberg of all people decides to do this movie called bridge of spies yes. that portrays the exchange of my father for a soviet spy rudolph abel in february of 62 brilliant the film 60th anniversary is next year so um, I first find out about this as a rumor back in June of 2014. And I'm thinking, oh, he's not going to do this. Why would Steven Spielberg do this? He has no reason to do this. And then in July of 2014, uh, I get confirmation that he's going to do it. And my first thought is, oh, my gosh, 
what, how is he going to depict my father? Mm-hmm. Um, so I reach out to some friends in Hollywood. I try to get an introduction. I can't. I don't know anybody that knows him. I resort to Google. I type in his name, his movie's names. I find people he worked with. I type in their names. I find some of their email addresses. I send out an unsolicited email to about five or six of his contemporaries, basically saying the following. Hello, my name's Gary Powers Jr. I'd like to talk to Mr. Spielberg about this movie that will portray my father. It's very important that we express the Powers family's concerns. If he bases the portrayal of my dad on the misinformation of the time, then they'll be painting him in a negative light. If they base it off the declassified information that's come to surface the last 50 plus years, they'll be painting him as a hero to our country. So for obvious reasons, it was very important for me to reach out and try to establish contact. As a result of the email, I get a phone call from Mark Platt. Mark Platt is the producer on this film. He's better known for his production of Wicked on Broadway. Oh, so okay. Very well regarded, very well um, uh, accomplished in Hollywood and on Broadway. Mark and I talk for an hour. Uh, he likes what I have to say. At the end of the conversation, he says, Hey, Gary, you're really knowledgeable about this episode of U.S. history, world history. Would you like to be a technical consultant on the film? Well, yes. That would be wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> what else would I say? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I get the contract. I read through it. It's pretty much I have to answer questions. I've got to be on set uh, to help them uh, with anything they need help with. I provide audio tapes of my dad speaking about his experiences so they can listen firsthand to what he went through. At the very end of the contract, it says, if I don't like the end result, I can't sue. And I'm thinking, oh, um, no, uh, <laughs> what am yeah. I getting involved in? <laughs> they take uh, the name, they use me, they use the family, then they do whatever they want. Oh, my gosh. So I thought long and hard, and at the end of the day, I figured, you know, it's better for me to be involved and help to steer them in the right direction. Otherwise, if I walk away, I won't be able to contribute whatsoever. So I did sign the dotted line, and I was a consultant on the film. I am very happy that I did decide to do it. It was an honor and a privilege to work with Spielberg, Tom Hanks, uh, Mark Reliance, who won the Oscar for his portrayal of the Soviet yeah. spy, and um, Austin Stoll, who portrayed my father, as well as all the other producers and crew members and prop guys and, and everybody who it ta- that it takes to do these films. So it was a wonderful experience. Um, I was able to talk directly to Mr. Spielberg and communicate with him about what took place. There's some great photos somewhere of us talking and interacting. Uh, My wife, my son, and I were able to sit behind him in one of the director's chairs to look how he directs his film. I mean, a a film student would give their eye teeth to experience what I was able to do. And I was just an honor and a privilege, and we're very thankful for how they portrayed my father. There is some misinformation there is some um, embellishment, uh, some artistic liberties. It's Hollywood. That's what they do. <laughs> right. They bring a historic event to life to keep the moviegoers on the edge of their th- seats. They want to keep them coming back for more. So they will make a little bit more um, dramatic effect in certain scenes to keep the audience on the edge of their seats. At the very end of the movie, however, even though there was some misinformation in it, they did honor Dad as a hero to our country in the postscript. So we, 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 have, we, we are delighted at the outcome, and we're very pleased with how uh, the film turned out. That had to be a bit surreal and emotional, I would imagine, to see your father being portrayed uh, in that way, in this beautiful, uh, just brilliant film. Uh, I, would, I would think it would be uh, touching on... Uh, some kind of emotional cord in there to, to see that really come to life. Well, it, it was definitely um, surreal uh, to know that, uh, you know, the, the the most respected and famous director of our lifetime is doing a yeah. film on my dad. Yeah. And so it, it was it was very um, humbling to know that uh, he did this. Uh, so we, we just, I mean, I don't know what else to say. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. it was an event of a lifetime. Right. Oh, cannot even imagine. Uh, well, are... hold, hold on one second. Let me yeah. uh, do a little uh, 
a post, not a postscript, but a, a little add-on to this. Okay. Um, you might not know, but some of your listeners might, that in 1976, there was a movie made about my father called The Francis Gary Power Story. It mm-hmm. was a TV movie for NBC television. It starred Lee Majors. Lee Majors in 1976 was the six million dollar man. Uh, right, right, right. He yeah. was he was you know the hottest actor in Hollywood at the time. Yeah. And so I'm uh, 10 or 11 years old when this is happening, and I am more excited about meeting Lee Majors than I am about <laughs> a movie being made about my dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's a kid for you. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Well, that is exciting. And there were a lot of women who would have wanted to, to be right there with you at oh, that sure. time period of his, of his career. You are a busy man. Uh, you are a lecturer, a writer. Um, you wear many, many, many hats. And that you took some time this evening to visit with me. Uh, and our listeners, I am thrilled. And I know our listeners will, too. I do want to mention... Uh, Chris Costello uh, and the podcast she did uh, with you and with the son, the late Sergei Khrushchev. Uh, and it's, um, it's, it's very informative and very interesting. So I want my listeners um, to know even more about you um, in that time period to please go to, it's called Chris on Q, C-U-E, Chris on Q. And there's another podcast about you, Gary, that's just excellent. So I want to direct people to go there and listen to that. Have we missed anything that you really would like to say on this podcast? I know you're written about a lot, you're talked to a lot, you speak a lot. But is there anything I've missed that I really should have brought into the conversation this evening? Well, just, just let, let me just kind of rattle off a little bit and we'll fill in the gaps there. Please um, do. Some of your listeners might not know who my dad is. And they're going, why are you interviewing this guy? (laughs) (laughs) So my dad was Francis Gary Powers, a U-2 pilot flying for the CIA who was shot down on May 1st of 1960 over the Soviet Union. He spent two years in a Soviet prison. He was exchanged for a Soviet spy, Rudolf Abel, in 62. He came home to a lot of controversy. During the Cold War in 1960, it was easier to blame the pilot for being caught and captured, having the plane fall out of the sky, than it was to admit the Soviets were more advanced than we were. It was not uh, something that would ever be considered. Oh, no, they can't have those missiles. They can't reach that altitude. It had to be the pilot's fault. So my book sets the record straight. Spy pilot, Francis Gary Powers, the U-2 incident, and a controversial Cold War legacy. You can get um, uh, copies on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or through eBay. If you would like autographed copies, you can get them through my website, spypilotbook.com. If you'd like to reach me, I'm always looking for lecture venues. Uh, You can reach me through garypowers.com. And then uh, lastly, I just want to thank you for reaching out to me and and wanting to talk to me about my life and what I've accomplished. Um, Most people want to talk about my father and what he's accomplished. So it was a very nice honor to be uh, recognized for this. Thank you. I am I'm the one who's honored. I truly am. And and I do encourage my listeners to to do their own research about your father, uh the the heroic father, the senior. Uh but junior also is very interesting as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. Who uh I tried to call you Mr. Powers, but you let me call you Gary. So thank you very much. <laughs> you are welcome, Pam. And once we're offline, I want to ask a few other questions. Okay, excellent. Um, And to my listeners, um, you know what to do. Um, You can always find these podcasts on northpalmbeachlife.com where you can see a photo of my speaker, my guest tonight. If you want to see what he looks like besides listen to the podcast, always going to be there. Also, don't forget to find us on YouTube. All of our podcasters, all my guests, not me. You don't want to see me out there. But our guests on the podcast, we always have a place for them on our YouTube channel as well. We really appreciate you. These podcasts are on so many platforms. You know you can find us on iTunes, Pandora, Spotify, and many, many others. They're always available on our website, northpalmbeachlife.com. We appreciate you for being with Gigi, that's me, in the 561 
always, and stay tuned.